Hi, welcome back. Uh, we have two keynotes. Uh, we will have a, a small uh, change, perhaps, to the to the program. Uh, that will have first uh, the the keynote from Isabel Lorai, um, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, and, but then we'll, from that, we would move into Brian Holmes's talk, and then both of them together with me will have a joint discussion also with 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 all of you at the end. So uh, once Isabel has finished. Direct questions that you have for uh, uh, clarification, technical issues, etc., around her paper, uh, you should ask, and 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 then we'll move on to Brian and have a general discussion, as I said, afterwards. Uh, also, uh, since we are trying to have a, a joint discussion rather than two discussions, uh, we are hoping that we can end a little bit sooner than nine o'clock, around eight thirty, I've been told, and at that moment. You're all welcome to go to the cafeteria over here in the museum where there will be a dinner for, for everyone. So we can continue the conversation under more relaxed and less formal terms at, at that point. So um, the first uh, speaker is uh, Isabel Loai, who's a political theorist and involved with a wonderful organization based in Vienna called the IPCP that I've also had the pleasure of collaborating with in the past. That stands for the European Institute for Progressive Cultural Policies. Among other things, they uh, edit a website and a book, book series called, called Transversal. That might be interesting for people also in terms of the conversations that we had uh, earlier and how to think of the transversality of struggles, not just thinking of precarity within the cultural sphere, but how it's perhaps a general condition within uh, labor today uh, across the globe, really. <coughs> More recently, uh, uh, Isabel has also published uh, a book that I can highly recommend called uh, State of Insecurity, Government of the Precarious. It came out this year, and it's available in the bookstore, so as a plug for you. Um, and uh, yeah, without further ado, I will, I will give the stage to Isabel, who will give a talk called Autonomy and Precarization, Neoliberal Entanglements of Labor and Care. Please, Isabel. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, for this kind and uh, PR instruction for the ERPCP. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here to Warsaw to give me the, uh, the, the opportunity to be here, and thanks for the hospita hospitality. And I'm very uh, glad that uh, what I now want to say in, I don't know, 40, 45 minutes uh, connects I think very well what is uh, already said, uh, and uh, it would be great to continue the discussion we just just started uh, with the public, so-called public workshop, and uh, would be great to have all this again uh, together after um, mine and uh, Prime's uh, talk. Over the past weeks, it's a bit difficult with the mic because it's... Over the, over the past weeks, we have been able to observe the autonomy of migration, once again striking through the traditional concept of autonomy of the former West. As the many in flight, independent of citizenship, practice the freedom of movement. The individual European nation states are reacting by opening and closing the borders with ever new attempts at regulation. But the refugees do not cease to invent new strategies and take new routes, as we already saw this July in Calais, in order to reach England or along the Serbian-Hungarian border at the beginning of September and along the new route via Croatia and Slovenia. The many overran police barriers, they are not letting themselves be detained on the way to their desired place of refuge. Together they set in motion marches on motorways and reach their further transport in buses and trains. They forced the prevailing European migration and border regime to break down. They disturbed political and social orders. 
Yet even if they were welcomed at first, as in, as in Munich, oh sorry, as in Munich by many re residents at the level of national and European policy, refugees are, if not illegalized and criminalized, hierarchized according to citizenship and countries of origin, into good, into good seekers of protection who have fled war, and those others, bad migrants, who only seek a better life, meaning work, and therefore immediately become competitors to the respective majority society. Or they quickly count, as it is called in the right-wing populism in Germany, as welfare freeloading poverty migration. But the European social welfare states cannot be sealed off along national lines. Without migration, they will sooner or later break down. The hierarchization of refugees and the ensuing, ensuing allocation of rights are also about the distinction between care and labor, an entanglement that is con constitutive for the development of liberal capitalist society in Europe. In my talk, I would like to consider in a larger historical genealogy questions about who counts as being in need of protection and care, who is capable of self-care, who cares and who labors. This means examining this civic capitalist understanding of autonomy, which emphasizes uh, independency from others in a very specific way, and which is deeply gendered and racialized. I'll, I'll analyze the entanglement of labor and care with the instrument of my political theory of government, uh, of, uh, sorry, of precar precarization. Autonomy as self-legislation, -le self-determination, and self-reliance, as the term is used in European modernity, is closely interwoven with, ma with, the male, with male figures of independence. This specific unconnectedness is not to be separated from notions of mobility, least of all from, from the freedom of movement that Hannah Arendt emphasizes as a condition of political freedom, as a condition for political action in the public sphere. But this freedom of movement is first able to unfold beyond the space of the private sphere that is con connoted as feminine and thus beyond care work. This is the basis for the conceptualization of one of the most typical figures of European modernity, the autonomous individual. This figure is free to the extent, you know that, that, is, that it devalues the reproduction of life. This negative freedom is profoundly gendered, as are along with it its conceptions of security and protection. In contrast to feminized insecurity and need for protection, Efforts to dispose of, this is, uh, can you hear me? I always, I have the, yeah, okay, the impression that it comes not to the back of the room. Effort, efforts to dispose of the feminine aspects of this figure of the autonomous individual in order to pres preserve it as a masculine one have marked our understanding of freedom, labor, and reproduction and care since the 17th century, and have had an impact on welfare state safeguarding in the second half of the 20th century. Under neoliberal condition, the autonomous conditions, the autonomous individual now finds itself again in a process of fundamental change. The relationship between autonomy and precarization is updated and becomes an instrument of domination in combination with self-responsibility. Of course, there are considerable dif differences between the neoliberal formations in Eastern and Western, Northern and Southern European countries. However, insufficient differentiation in this regard will remain a gap in my talk today. Since the 17th century, autonomy has de devalued, de 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 developed, uh, the, the mic is a nightmare for me here. <laughs> Hope it's not for you, because it, it's, um, okay, it's okay. Since the 17th century, autonomy has 
developed in European modernity within the assemblage of the precarious. Independence is interlinked with logics of protection and security, which devalue, overlook, or ward off fundamental precariousness as threatening, or in other, other words, the mutual dependency on others and connection with others. In this historical genealogy, autonomy is based on warding off the potentiality of the common. The negation of shared precariousness and thus of the fundament, fundamental necessity of care constitutes not only the autonomous individual but also the modern architecture of statehood, democracy, and capitalism. The negation of precariousness structures central liberal democratic norms and parameters such as freedom, equality, and property. To further develop these theses and questions, I distinguish between three dimensions of the precarious. Precariousness, precarity, and governmental precarization. Precariousness describes the social ontological level. From birth on, bodies are dependent on care and reproduction by others. In order to survive, they are dependent on social relationships. Living beings always exist relationally. A completely autonomous life is an illusion, and invulnerability is a fantasy of omnipotence. However, despite care and reproduction, bodies remain precarious. It is inevitable that they become ill, suffer accidents, die. There is no complete protection from this precariousness. Precariousness is shared with others and thus points out to the fundamental connection with others, but does not make everyone the same. It designates no anthropological constant because its decree is historically and geographically very differently determined. This is exactly the fundamental dimension of life that has been systematically devalued with the formation of bourgeois liberal society, democracy and capitalist production conditions and has been warded off as threatening. With the construction of threatening precariousness, the second dimension of the precarious is already addressed, the dimension of precarity. This designates conditions of legal, political, economic, and social inequality, hierarchizing, categorization, structural discrimination, belonging, and exclusion. In short, precarity designates domination conditions that are divided up and distributed through protection, care, and safeguarding. The third dimension is governmental precarization. This dimension of the precarious expands Michel Foucault's concept of governmentality, by which he means the techniques of governing by biopolitically oriented capitalist democracies. Against this background, governmental precarization emphasizes how conducting state governance and individualized self-governing are intertwined in governing through insecurity. Autonomy is one of the cornerstones of these governmental techniques up to the present. In the late 17th century, and now I will make a very quick ride through the European political theory. In the late 17th century, John Locke, the founder of liberal thinking, understood the individual's right to self-determination as freedom that is not only linked to property, but also to labor. Locke conceived labor as free labor in the framework of which the relationship to one's own body is a property relationship. Every man, according to Locke, has a property in his own person. The labor of his body and the work of his hands are probably his. These thoughts were taken up again 100 years later by Adam Smith, 1776, uh, when he declared this property, which every man has in his own labor, is the original foundation of all other property. Smith was convinced that the freedom of productive labor would uh, would lead to the worker being able to feed not only himself as a free man, but also a family, and that he would be independent from charity provided by state or non-state institutions. In the second half of the 18th century, the idea of the freedom of labor as independence from conditions of feudal coercion 
intertwines with the bourgeois idea of freedom as volunt voluntary submission to impersonal law applying to all, the now self-decreed laws of political democracy. Freedom intertwines with autonomy. The new bourgeois law, laws replace the personal dependency and arbitrariness of the Ancien Regime. Yet the ideas of freedom, equality, autonomy, and self-determination have been based on contradic contradiction, contradictions, which is very well known, from the very beginning. The bourgeois demo democratic social contract is founded solely on the legal equality of the property-holding white male free citizen. The equality and freedom of all others was postponed in the best case for the future. In fact, the arrangement of bourgeois male autonomy and submission is to a crucial decree based on the patriarchal subjugation of women in the private sphere. This involves the negative freedom from precariousness and constitutively being connected with others. In bourgeois capitalist society, precariousness is domesticated and enclosed in the private sphere. Care and reproduction are feminized, depoliticized, devalued, structured by precarity on the basis of gender, sexuality, and race. This division of social space according to a gender-specific distribution of labor and the distribution of hierarchical subjectivations allows the advent of the new mode of governing of the bourgeois capitalist society, which Foucault called biopolitics. It is a governing through self-governing and exercising modes of behavior. Every person in a population must learn, more or less self-responsibly, to have a body that is not independent from certain conditions of existence. They must learn to influence their precari precariousness depending on how they live, take care of their health, work. These kinds of relations to one's own body serve the production of a class-specific and heterosexualized, heterosexual racialized gender binary, which not only secured the maintenance of the labor force in a gender segregating way, but also ensured generativity to strengthen the nation state at the same time, along with constructions of a superior white race. Such ideas could not have emerged without the theory of possessive individualism and the liberal ideas of freedom, autonomy, and civilization. For the male worker, however, precariousness could not be sufficiently domesticated through individualization, devaluation of the others, and feminization of reproduction in the private sphere. Smith's idea that free labor must be able to feed a family quickly turned out to be utopian capitalism. The freedom of labor capacity was no protection against precariousness, existential vulnerability due to illness, accidents, or unemployment remained intact. Collective social welfare state institutions of insurance, which first have to be fought, had to be fought for, were able to ensure relative autonomy, significantly for the male breadwinner. The welfare state and organizational structures of the largely male workers made it clear that the bourgeois logic of property could not be generalized, that autonomy and individualization were not possible for the workers in liberal dem democracy, democracies without collective protection and insurance systems. Legal claims and solidarity led to a social compromise that provided a welfare state complement to Fordist individualization up until to the 1970s. In this way, the idea of male freedom and autonomy through wage labor could be could collectively supported and maintained through the consolidation of the gender-specific separation between paid productive and unpaid reproductive labor and between a public and a private sphere. At the same time, those constructed as dangerous others were striated and marginalized at the peripheries of the side of societies. Already in the 1980s, black feminist theories such as Patricia Hill Collins showed that the unambiguous assignment of women to the private sphere of the family and unpaid reproductive labor represents a white and bourgeois model and does not correspond to the realities of the lives of black, black women, white proletarian women, and especially migrant women in the U United States. But the housewife who is dependent on her husband and, this, 
and his family wage was, and this is not only true for the US, the standard for state welfare support for women, and therefore also for those who didn't live according to this family model. Most affected by this are single mothers, and it is no different today. In their investigation of the discourses, of the discourse about welfare mothers, Nancy Fraser and Linda Gordon have shed light on the function of female connoted social dependency for the, auto for the autonomy of white male workers. For this masculine autonomy is based on the extensive non-perception of their own subjugation in production conditions. At the moment when white men were made politically and legally equal, quote, by definition then, economic inequality among white men no longer create dependency. Thus, dependency was redefined to refer exclusively to those non-economic non relations, so-called non-economic relations, of subordination deemed suitable only for people of color and for white women, end quote. This male form of autonomy thus was thus based on the precarity of others who were differentiated in their subordinate dependency into those who appeared worthy of being protected and those who did not into good household dependency and an increasingly bad, or at least du dubious, charity dependency. A similar pattern can be seen today with respect to refugees. The differentiation into good refugees in need of protection and bad welfare freeloaders. What currently distinguishes neoliberalism in Europe is despite assumptions that are, or th that are still widespread, that the precarious are no longer solely those who can be marginalized to the peripheries of society. Due to the individualizing restructuring of the social welfare state, the deregulation of, of the labor market, and the expansion of precarious employment conditions in, inside the EU, we currently find ourselves in a process of normalization of precarization, which also affects larger portions of the middle class. In this process of normalization, precarization has become a political and economic instrument of governing. At the same time, people continue to be legally, economically, and socially marginalized and excluded through structural inequality, through precarity, which means that they are less protected than others or protection is altogether denied them. This becomes apparent in the different European democracies with the simultaneously occurring processes of economic and financial border elimination on the one hand and broader creation to ward off and border creation to ward off global migration on the other. A global hierarchy of mobility and legal status is taking place through which migrants are made precarious to the extreme. The demand for mobility and flexibility for EU citizens on the labor market is contradicted by the insecure status of migrants which leads to a subordinate positioning in civil society and enables hyper-exploitation of these others, not only undocumented persons in post fordist or neoliberal labor markets. In European governmentality through precarization, the precarious are extremely hierarchized through precarity. Governing through precarization is today no longer fundamentally, this is another uh, transformation, no longer fundamentally based on the gender hierarch hierarchical and heteronormative dichotomy of autonomy and dependency which was still conventional in the Fordist social welfare state. The dichotomy between male individualization and female feminization is preached. Social safeguarding and thus social reproduction is increasingly decollectivized. It is again being privatized, but this time handed over to the self-responsibility of the individual. The consequence of this is that for more and more people, retirement provisions, health and education can only be financed through indebtedness. This actualization of insecure autonomy results in new inequalities. In this neoliberal precarity and the expansion of precarization, the possibility of experiencing precariousness as a fundamental connectedness with others, as 
commonly shared vulnerability vanishes. Instead, the fear of precariousness has an individualizing effect that enhances governability within the framework of neoliberal governmentality. Patriarchal heterosexual gender arrangements are not completely breached by these transformations, however, but instead are only partially shifted. Old inequalities are manifested through, among other things, the still devalued care and reproduction work which is additionally organized in an international distribution of labor, econ economically and ethnically differentiated and hierarchized. In the political economy of neoliberalism, the internationalization of the private sphere is based on the hierarchization of rights as a condition for the extreme precarity of undocumented and Ill illegalized labor forces, mostly female migrants. For EU citizens, Citizens, the neoliberal flexibilization of labor relations means, as it were, a flexibilization of family relations, but it doesn't necessarily change the hierarchically organized gender division of labor. In places where social reproduction is not monetized through child care centers and nurse nursing services, it gets reprivatized through traditional heterosexual family relations. In Northern Europe, this development is greatly supported by the labor of women from Eastern European countries, such as Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, and Bulgaria, usually through in, so-called informal work without taxes or social security. And the gap at home fill again women from Belarus, for example, well known as care chains. Parallel to this, Patriarchal gender relations are increasingly dissolving and the associated hegemonic masculinity are eroding. Masculinities are eroding. What is evident here is that neoliberal governing through precarization does not have to rely on a gender distribution of labor and a heteronormative generativity in the same way that was necessary for the formation of liberal capitalism and bourgeois society. Neoliberal governmentality primarily needs supportive, protective, and reproducing private relationships, which in this respect take over the governmental function of the heteronormative family and the former welfare state. Even when family structures still absorb a lot of effects of precarization. This neoliberal meaning of the private culminates in states increasing entrustment of care activities, for example, vis-a-vis -vis refugees, to private support networks. Unpaid labor coded as voluntary engagement is becoming more and more useful for a social state that has been dismantled in many places and for an actualized neoliberal regime of migration. Governing through precarization requires specific forms of freedom and autonomy which are condensed in the concept of self-responsibility. Social safeguarding is transferred back to the responsibility of single persons as autonomous individuals, no longer primarily with a gendered connotation, but with genealogies back to the times before the formation of the different European social welfare states, which now become recognizable as historical exceptions. With the call for self-responsibility, not only are the, bourgeois, um, are the bourgeois biopolitics of neoliberal governmentality actualized, but the morally supported ideology of autonomy independent from the social welfare state also returns. With the moral understanding of freedom and autonomy as self-responsibility, precarization, poverty, and dependency on the minimalized social welfare state can be discredited as being purely self-inflected. Securing one's own life with the, with the now activating, activating social welfare state continues to center on wage labor. Neo Neoliberal working conditions require workers to be completely available at all times, while simultaneously constraining labor and social rights. Time and capacity for care activities for others become scarce. 
Self-care serves almost exclusively to produce and reproduce a profitable and productive body. Reproduction as a model of subjectivation is shifted to the realm of capitalized production. Under the paradigm of mobility, flexibility, and competition, not only are social rights reduced, but the labor relation is also structured by obligations to conformist engagement and performance agreements. New dependencies on state institutions, employers, creditors and banks emerge in precarious working and living conditions where individuals seem to be left to shift for themselves with no possibility for demanding rights and no knowledge of them. Conformism and fear increase as well as the acceptance of authoritarian structured working conditions and institutions. Autonomy as self-responsibility becomes the disciplining instrument of domination. In this political-economic regime, self-government and self-conduct primarily serve political governability and capitalized valorization, and the fear of precariousness maintains this relation. Not only in the middle classes of the former West, the normalization of precarization is currently still alleviated for many through family support and inheritances. The fear of biographical and gener generational social decline and the, the demands of privatized risk management still correlate with resentful isolation tendencies and demands for security against those declared as risk groups, usually migrants, or those positioned as migrants. In the permanent race for the desired better safeguarding of one's own life and proximal social space against competing others who are perceived as a threat, what is overlooked is that a sustainably better life can be neither an autonomous matter nor the matter of a delimited national community. If we think radically about what a different society, a different form of living together might look like, updating or enlarging the welfare state cannot be our ultimate concern, for the function of the welfare state is always to provide cushioning for neoliberal liberal and neoliberal economic practices. Instead, we need a break with neoliberal thought and action. What needs to be undone is this neoliberal link between autonomy and valorization, which also meets a break with a predominant liberal understanding of how society is constitu constituted and of belonging. But how might we picture a social tie where caring practices and the need for care are no longer devalued, privatized, and hierarchized through, through the denial of rights? How can the patterns that regulate decision-making about who gets protected and who is denied protection be broken open? The queer feminist theory, theory, theorists and activists of the Madrid-based group Precarias a la Deriva have offered important considerations to such a new way of thinking. They propose the concept of, and it's very hard to translate it, care community, care citizenship, a cuidadania. The Spanish neologism cuidadania conjoins state citizenship, theodadania, with care, cuidado, into a new form of socially politically, legally, and economically living together beyond the nation-state border regime, in which the re relationality with others is not to be broken off, but is instead considered fundamental. Cuidadania is not a social and political community that is constituted through the categorization and hierarchization of those in need of care and protection. Rather, the precarious, are interested in sustainably breaching existing logics of security and insecurity. Their political and social strategy consists in enhancing the value of care through a new understanding of care activities 
and needs for care and to make it a starting point for political economic considerations. According to the precarious, we have been facing in a multidimensional care crisis for some time now. This is not to be separated from the precarization of existence with which more and more people are confronted in different ways. For irrespective of how great the investment of capitalized and technologically mediated self-care and irrespective of whatever they are categorized of whether they are categorized as in need of care or not, bodies need a roof over their head, possibilities for working and education, food, sexuality, and support when they are ill. Bodies are precarious, not only at the early stage, stages of life, but through our, throughout entire lifespan, and in particular when they age. Bodies remain dependent on the care of others. As the precarious uses the term care, it, it covers all areas of social reproduction, housework and care work, as well as activities in the areas of health and education. And they take forms of communicative and effective labor into consideration. They situate the aspects of care in socially living, condition, in, in socially living together with others. In order to deconstruct the phantasm of autonomy and superiority, according to Precaria Zaladeriva, and here they refer, of course, to many queer feminist thoughts, it is necessary to break with three fundamental dichotomies of liberal state citizenship. First, it is necessary to break with the separation between a public and a private sphere, and thus with the relationship of subordination between the genders. The second break that is needed is the break with the gender-specific division of labor, unequal pay, unpaid care work, and its concomitant unequal access to social ins insurance, wealth, and participation. Both breaks are decisive for the third break with the separation between autonomy and dependency, which perme permeates the understanding of self-determination and self-sustenance. For dependency means the incapacity to realize the project of individual emancipation. In this perspective, only those who are autonomous, who count as autonomous, are able to shape their own lives. The consequences of this is a very limited, one-sided and individualistic understanding of care, in which dependents are cared for by those who are independent, healthy, and capable of self-care. Envisioning care differently consequently also means understanding emancipation and thus autonomy and self-determination in a new way. For care ceases to be understood as a one-dimensional and individualized relation between dependents and those who are independent when emancipation is no longer imagined as liberation from precariousness. But above all, this understanding of care is freed from moralistic elements. Care no longer depends on the private and contingent empathy of others. It no longer obligates gratitude. The phantasm of autonomy and supremacy in which those in need of protection are viewed as victims as in a paternalistic manner is deconstructed. In order to not negate the agency of those in need of care, in the critique of autonomy and supremacy, the precarious do not reverse these dichotomies. Instead, they propose a recognition of the tensions that permeate these concepts. For the relation between autonomy and dependency, this means not denying the necessity of autonomy, not treating the tensions between these two poles through a hierarchizing separation, but rather taking into consideration that our autonomy and singularity is inevitably grounded in the interaction with others. Even if private or volunteer support is necessary for survival in situations of acute crisis, what is needed, according to the precarious, is a general right to care for and to be cared for, which simultaneously means 
that obligations to perform care work do not follow one's positioning in society. Cuidadania is based in this right in which individuals are not understood as separate from one another, but as manifold, mutually relating singularities. It is a right that recognizes the commonly shared precariousness and is no longer based on a legal person, but on a legal singularity, according to which citizens' rights ceases to be hierarchized. In Cuidadania, citizens' rights are no longer tied to the modern figure of the autonomous individual, the ideal ma male bourgeois subject of a nation state, who stabilizes the superior position by outsourcing his own precariousness and shifting it as a deficit to the precarity of the devalued, subordinated, excluded, and invisible others, is divested of his formation. The liberal and neoliberal governmental interplay of control regulation and governing which grants citizens' rights to the logic of the need for workers and suitability as con consumers is to be broken open. Cuidadania is conceived beyond the nation-state border regime. In order to articulate cuidadania, what is needed, therefore, is a constituent process, and in the, in the term Tony Negri has um, invented. A constituent process in which new subjectivities are invented to arrange shared precarious life in common, in which the security logics of precarity can be broken open, and for which the extreme differences in precarization and the, common, the commonness of precariousness simultaneously form the point of departure. Such a social tie, historically fully new to Western democracies, does not constitute itself by closing itself off from those who are seen as foreign or other, as intruders or welfare freeloaders. Those who have to start in a new place because they, flee, because they fled cease to be dependent on the worry and care of volunteers, cease to be subject to paternalism. Instead of integration into an existing political and social community, this is a new form of democracy beyond the nation state. Migration is no longer conceived as immigration or emigration in the national state framework, but in itself will and independence from national and supranational regulations and border regimes as global autonomy of migration as freedom of movement. With this fundamental change in perspective, cuidadania begins in the present. And all, of, and all who live together in this way become aware that migration means a desire for a good life, not only for those in movement. But that the good life in the Jews in society, in fact, only stands a chance for all when it emanates from care and welcomes migrants on equal terms with all democratic rights. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions and comments also because this issue of care came up uh, earlier today. So I don't know if anybody has the first question they want to ask. I'll come on with the mic. Uh, thank you very much for connecting the problem of problems of precarity, growing precarity with the uh, processes of the dismantling of the welfare state uh, because uh, I think this is... Uh, uh, very connected issue, uh, uh, also for artists, because uh, in former uh, welfare state, for example, uh, uh, regimes, uh, many artists have had, uh, apart from their artistic work, uh, had very uh, uh, safe positions uh, in educational field. Uh, working as uh, uh, trainers and uh, uh, educators. Uh, today it is uh, uh, much more uh, limited uh, and this is 
mostly because of the processes of the uh, uh, dismantling of welfare state. And uh, I'm uh, uh, especially interested in this issue because uh, I have written uh, already a book about the processes, uh, about the main tool of, of one of the main tools uh, of dismantling of the welfare state, that is the ideology of civil socie society and promotion of the non-governmental organizations as the uh, uh, alternative substitute of the welfare state institutions with broad and uh, more, more precarious uh, uh, work places for uh, uh, people that previously had a uh, more safe uh, position in the state institutions. But, uh, uh, But today, I think that, that uh, uh, this is much more connected with, with wor what I was uh, previously uh, speaking about, talking about. Uh, that is the problem of uh, the reduction of progressive taxation. The welfare state depends on progressive taxation. There is uh, no possibility to uh, uh, fund public institutions from uh, regressive uh, taxes. And in the same uh, way as the artistic wage depends on the level of its taxation, in the same way uh, the safe uh, network of, uh, uh, of uh, state institutions that uh, uh, provide health care uh, that provides uh, 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 so uh, retirement systems uh, also for uh, for artists uh, it all depends on the uh, progressive taxation and the problem of the reflection on the on this uh, dependence on the fiscal systems, I think it's, it's uh, not uh, uh, well understood. So is, is there a specific question? Because I think we're getting into the discussion now a little bit, so... No. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll return to that in the, in the discussion, I think. Uh, there was two questions down here, first, come on, and then here. <laughs> Thank you so much for this uh, fantastic uh, work that you've done. You really connected a lot of things that I think were really important to connect. So thank you so much for that. Um, first of all, uh, just a short question. Will the text be available after this? Will it be published or? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the second question was, um, you, you, you talked a bit about um, how, I, I'm not, I was just unsure if I understood it correctly, but uh, neoliberalism was actually, uh, neoliberal governmentality was actually eroding uh, this, uh, this traditional masculine uh, uh, gender model because it relied on relations. Uh, and I just, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could just quickly kind of uh, explain that point. Uh, the, the central arg argument was that um, this kind of, uh, of governability through a dismantled and restructured welfare state that is most focused on the individualization and privatiza privatization of risk does not, uh, is not based as much as the Fordist welfare state and Fordist economy on a heterosexual uh, gender, uh, gender binary, and so not this this neoliberal governmentality is not based in the same way or in a different. It, it is, it is not. I would say really, it is not based on this on a hegemonic, patriarchal masculinity anymore. It is, it is. It's possible to combine it. We can see it everywhere in a conservative. conservative uh, um, in, in, in conservative governing, but I think in the last step, neoliberal governmentality is not, does not need this traditional hegemonic masculinity. 
but it needs, of course, the relatedness, the support, the, the supports of the of, of social relations. So this is, I would, I would say, one of the reasons uh, that it is when the Catholic Church is not very dominant in uh, in a country, it is more and more possible to legalize equal sex partnerships because, because on a political and on an economical level for the construction of nation states, heterosexual gender binary is not necessary. Heterosexual family constructions are not necessary anymore in such a fundamental way as it was uh, in the last uh, centuries or even in the social welfare state constructions uh, till the seven, 1970s. Can I just follow a uh, follow-up question? Uh, do you think that this then makes the issue of race distinction more important for new liberal government agency? No, I think it's, uh, it's flexible. Uh, uh, um, it can play with the so-called diversity things, diversity differences, uh, to be more effective of all the skills of the workers you have in all their diversity. It is flexible and it needs on a political level, but this is one of the argument, there is a connection, an interconnection between uh, the, the normalization of precarization and the demands for security and demands for the um, uh, for renationalization, for borders, uh, on a conservative scale, but probably not only there. And we have to be aware of it. It's very flexible, and uh, it's yeah, it's interrelated. And uh, the liberal inter the liberal connection of freedom and security turns out into a very fundamental connection with. Um, not freedom, and, yeah, with freedom and insecurity, so. Yeah, well, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question which is rather, sorry for that, quite philosophical and perhaps completely scholastic, but maybe it is relevant because, well, it concerns basically the development of your argument at the beginning where you attributed the concept of autonomy to Lockean liberalism. And I think it is not there, to be honest. I mean, uh, they have freedom, and freedom, as you rightly put it, defined as self-ownership and the right to acquire ownership plus freedom from constraint. While the idea of autonomy, well, is Kantian, and it's quite different because it's about acting according to your own law. It's a self-constitution, which doesn't really require this uh, relation to, to property, self-property, it, it, it's quite a different thing. And of course, philosophically afterwards, it, it, it bears quite different fruit, even if I agree that in the end, autonomy has also its own patriarchy, uh, namely sending women back to nature. Uh, this is, this is the, the, the trick. But, uh, but you, you, you talked about as if liberals initially in the 17th and 18th century were, um, uh, were operating the idea of autonomy. I don't think they did. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my argument was that autonomy uh, has its own patriarchy. One point. The second point is the argument with Locke was that he uh, combined freedom with labor. And uh, I didn't mention Kant, sorry for that. But uh, the argument was that uh, in the development of bourgeois society, bourgeois democracies, uh, freedom con was connected with autonomy. So. It's in the paper already. Uh, so I would, I would like to ask um, a bit more to, to elaborate this, um, this relation of neoliberalism and, uh, and the welfare state, um, because uh, I think like we don't have any more welfare state and since the Reagan and Thatcher project of the 70s, like there is no welfare state as such historically. We have neoliberal state and uh, like Probably I, I'm just like uh, thinking about welfare in the term of organizing welfare uh, as a com as a com common you know like as a communal project uh, and not in the terms of the welfare welfare state what historical welfare state was as a product of the Cold War 
and uh, social democr democracy in the West and uh, what was like a welfare state in the, in the ex-communist countries. I mean, this is completely another, another like uh, form of the welfare state. Yeah, but this is the development I wanted to describe, another form of the welfare state, a dismantling, a transformation, a fundamental transformation. And of course it is cynical to call it welfare state or social, of course. But uh, what, is, what still remains in a, in, 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 a, in a different way, of course, as in the 70s, it is a strategy and instrument of governing. Yeah, it is, it is, uh, it is uh, as it was, a compromise between, uh, however you want to call it, uh, to, 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 uh, to make capitalist conditions livable. Uh, now it is very, in, the, it is, uh, in this activating, activating mode, we have it extremely since the 2000s, and as far as I know, it's uh, the same in Poland. Uh, it is an instrument of governing, and of course, we have to uh, uh, we have to be aware what is social welfare state nowadays, what is f its function is. And my argument, this was the the reason, one of the reasons I did this big genealogy through history, is there is no way to go back to the 70s welfare state because it was deeply gendered and racialized. So we have to invent, starting from precariousness and precarization, we have to invent something new, what is needed for, for collective security, I don't know. And breaking through the, 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 the thoughts, the way of thinking that are so um, stable in their transformations. This is the argument. Yeah? It's not to get rid of, 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 of the need of, secure, of security or of insurance, not, but we have to invent it anew in these situations and in a new way beside nation state. Um, thank you very question. much for both the talk and the last uh, answer because somehow it made certain things that I was also thinking about a bit more clear. Because I was, like, since a couple of weeks, I'm actually, I have this either fix, which is uh, the institutions of the future, or the future institutions of the common or stuff, like things around that. So I was curious, but I believe this is a question for the whole conference for us to, to discuss, so I will, not dis I, will, I will not ask you directly, or maybe, I mean, if you want, you can say something about the possible institutions of the future. The, the second, precisely, which, preserve ourselves from this identitarian claims and the stabilizations required by identity definitions, but also which allow a certain form of stability, a certain form of temporal stability, for instance, which gives the possibility to really produce support. I was also thinking of the concept of care while you were talking, and I think it's extremely, I mean, the talk was, was great and was situating the care at the core of the, of the future, um, of the thinking of the future, and this is, I think, super important. And uh, I think in Poland, the, it's very rare that you would, I mean, care resides on the margins of thinking of, of, of precarity, but not really in the core of it, in the majority of, 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 of elaborations on this topic. So this is a very valuable um, contribution to our discussions here also. But I was also thinking of this concept, a bit extravagant concept of Negri on one hand, so the love, um, and on the other hand, the love labor from Swedish yeah. love. Yeah, I, I know, it's, it's very extravagant to speak about that, but let's try. And then um, the other thing is uh, love labor, a concept of Marxist feminists from, from Sweden, Anna Jonas Dottir and, and other people. It was also discussed by some younger generation um, Austrian scholars recently. I think, I can't remember the name of the review, but people based in Vienna were sort of trying to approach this concept also. So love labor as a kind of dialectics because care has this um, understanding of being like a form of labor. So also something that involves affect, but affect is not at its core. And it's easy to, to reduce care to work somehow. So this concept of love labor has uh, a purpose of, 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 of solving the care or the affect from solely being perceived as work. So I'm curious what, you know, what would be your opinions here? And I really was happy when I heard that 
this concept of autonomy was based on like precarity of others historically. This was, I think, a very beautiful, uh, beautiful formulation. So I wanted to thank you for, for, for saying that because it was really an, a beautiful sentence. Uh, yeah. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I, I never heard of this uh, love, uh, labor, uh, love labor. Love um, uh, it, labor. I can only say that it reminds me uh, on on some struggles, feminist struggles of the 70s, that uh, spoke about uh, uh, love as labor, and. Uh, um, uh, problematizing the unpaid reproduction work, and I don't. Yeah, I, I think it's something new. I can't uh, say something about that. Uh, um, I, I, I just want to say something not about what you want to hear about in, uh, the future institutions of the common, or be more concrete. I would just say that uh, I um, have big problems with. Um, Future, with the kind of, with the temporality of the future, because I think we have to rethink the present, uh, not in a the not only in a theoretical way, but we have to start from the present and be aware of the present in analyzing and in acting in the present. And I could speak uh, one hour about the present because I'm just inventing or, 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 or writing on a book that is presentist, it's called Presentist Democracy, though to rethink democracy in, in, in um, uh, thinking on the present in a different way. So I would say, okay, look at the experiments of the, of the practices of institutions of the common that already exist or are in practice. And um, yeah, we can already learn a lot from them. And it's not what Gigi uh, said, it's not about copying, just experimenting with it in the present now. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So I think we will move on to the next presentation and then we'll return to some of these questions in the discussion in the end. So thanks, Isabel.